Thank you very much, uh, Tracy, and thank you again to Capilano University. We have something in common with Capilano uh, at IUPUI. We are also preparing to celebrate our 50th anniversary this coming year. I have the privilege today of introducing Dr. Janina Taylor Baker, the Assistant Director of NAGOA, the National Institute for Learning Outcomes Assessment. I'm going to say a little bit about NILOA for those who aren't familiar with it. It is the leading organization in the U.S. conducting research on and disseminating assessment practices. It's based at Indiana University and the University of Illinois. Its staff, associates, and board comprise a who's who list of luminaries in the world of assessment and higher education. And its website at learningoutcomesassessment.org provides a wealth of resources on assessment and teaching and learning in higher education more broadly. And now a little bit about Dr. Baker. Um, her, in, her research interests focus on assessment at minority-serving institutions and access and equity issues for minority students and administrators. She works out of the University of Illinois, where she earned her PhD in educational organization and leadership with a concentration on higher education. Before joining NILOA, she served as Director of Institutional Effectiveness and Planning at Richland Community College. And she is also the mother of three boys, ages 11, 9, and 5. So I remarked to her this morning as we were walking over that giving this keynote probably seems like a measure of activity for her. <laughs> Janita will be speaking to us today about Nyloa's research on emerging trends and assessment. I've heard about some of this research and I've actually used some of the uh, research for my own work. Uh, so I think you'll find it very interesting and you'll find some interesting parallels and areas of convergence between that research and some of the work that we do and we talk about at Google. Please help me welcome Dr. Janita Taylor Baker. Introduce us all the time. That sounds way better than what I would have said. All right. So, yes, I am with the National Institute for Learning Outcomes Assessment. For those of you who don't want to say that long title, I know I don't all the time, uh, we like to say Naloa. We like to think it's a little Hawaiian, so we go with, with the Naloa piece. Um, but we are located in, co-located in Illinois and Indiana, so that's about all the extent of, of, of the fun. Um, we were actually established in, I'm going to turn this right, yes. we were established in 2008 um, by George Koo, whom many of you probably have heard of, he does a lot in the, the cultures of uh, higher education and student affairs assessment world, and Stan Eikenberry, who was the former president of the University of Illinois. They actually established NALOA in response to the Spellings Commission report that said learning just wasn't happening on, on college campuses and also in anticipation of the Higher Ed Act being reauthorized. So we wanted to show that students were learning, that there was evidence of student learning. There was no place that, that we could house this information. So NALOA was really established as this resource repository where we tried to gather all things assessment in one spot. So if you wanted to come, this is where you would go. Um, and you can see our mission up there is to document um, all that's happening ex specifically to undergraduate education. So we didn't exclude K-12 or graduate education, but our focus mainly is around undergraduate education. Um, when we did the resources and the research and, and the resources piece, we found that there were there's a ton of possibilities for research. And so you can see on our website we do occasional papers, reports. Um, oftentimes we don't do those ourselves. We find experts in those areas who then write those papers out for us. And you'll see some of those resources listed here today. I think um, those have been amazing resources as we continue with this journey of, of trying to future-proof um, assessment practice um, as we continue to move forward. That said, this is our website. Um, we, this is it until October. Um, as we, I said, we've been established since 2008, and so it's looked this exact same way since 2008, and tons of resources have been on it. So if you often try and look for those resources, you might not be able to find them. So we often say, email us. We'd be happy to point you in the direction. 
but we are um, getting our website redesigned and, and should be done in October. That said, all of our resources are um, distributed monthly through our newsletter. We have about 12,000 plus sub subscribers. If you see that link over on the right hand side, join the email list. That's where you can keep up to date. Um, any new articles, new papers, reports, all that's released through our newsletter. So we, I invite you to, to join. That brings us to why I'm here, why was I asked, right? I think Susan kind of expounded a little bit upon that. Um, we did release a report at, earlier this year. Um, we surveyed the provosts or their designees, perhaps some of you in the room actually took the report or took the survey um, itself uh, to find out what's happening on campuses around assessment practice, what's happening um, around those the important factors and forces that are affecting their assessment practice on campus. Um, and then also, what other initiatives are, are campuses involved in? There's so many that's happening across the space. Um, oftentimes we get asked to come in and talk to institutions and we say it's about assessment, um, their assessment plans, process, but we often get roped into other conversations. And so we wanted to know what else is happening on, on these campuses that oftentimes people on their own campuses don't realize. Uh, we also asked some, some questions about, some open-ended questions about what changes are happening on campus, um, any uh, issues that they were, that they wanted to potentially uh, have some resources on. So I think it was a pretty uh, well-rounded survey and just trying to find out what's happening on campuses around assessment. Um, our sample that we ended up uh, we actually sampled all regionally accredited undergraduate degree granting institutions, so there are almost 3,000 of those. Um, our response rate was a little bit lower than what we wanted in, in previous times as we've done this survey two other times before. Uh, we only had 811 institutions and we tried many different ways to get more uh, institutions involved, but I think it still gave us some good data uh, to provide and, and be able to report back on and looking at the landscape. These are the past two reports. So if you um, haven't seen uh, these reports, this is kind of this third survey really bounced off uh, of these, these other two. The first one on the left, more than, you, more than you think, less than we need, learning outcomes assessment in American higher education, really just took a landscape uh, to talk of what was happening around assessment on campuses. This, <laughs> this report, if you read the full one, is long. So we wrote an abridged report that tries to synthesize the data itself, but we really wanted to just see what was out there, what was happening, um, and that really laid the groundwork for future surveys and, and really a lot of the research that we've conducted since then. The second report we did in 2014, um, after the survey we conducted, knowing what students know and can do, the current state of student learning outcomes assessment in U.S. higher education. And I think that this uh, report, again, looked at some of the data that we were um, looking at in the first survey, but then we expounded a little bit and looked at um, the impact in use. If you've heard of the degree qualifications profile and tuning, we tried to incorporate some of that into that second survey to understand what was happening on the campuses. So I think it did a really good job, uh, those first two surveys of laying of, of where we're headed uh, next. And this third survey really, I think, um, showed some light on, on, again, over the past 10 years, about 10 years, the practice that's been laid, the groundwork that's been laid, the foundation of how we are going to move forward and those places where provosts are really finding finding um, the, the practices that are most useful and most meaningful to their campuses. And again, as you see the title of that paper, Trending Toward More uh, Authentic Student Learning, that's where we're seeing, that's what we're seeing, it's what provosts uh, are seeing and, and want uh, more of, and of course students are, are integral in that. So to kind of couch some of the findings that, uh, that came about from the report, uh, in, in the report, I'm going to also use our NALOA policy statement. We developed this in May 2016, so after those first two reports, and after case studies and occasional papers and other reports that we conducted, we wanted to offer these five principles to help guide effective assessment practice. I think that you'll find with NALOA's work, we never give you a step-by-step -step guide of how to, Obviously, there's so many ways that this work can be done, and depending on your context, your mission, your students, the work looks different everywhere. But we do offer principles and we offer reflective questions often that will help you, will help assist you in, in moving forward. And this was one of those pieces, the policy statement. 
So as I, I'll lead with the principles, there's the, the five that we'll, we'll discuss and then catch some of the findings underneath that. So you can understand how the two work together. I think um, it's interesting that the, the findings from our last survey report fit really well with our principles. So that also helps us feel better that we are going in the, in the right direction. So that said, the first principle, develop specific actionable student learning outcome statements. Um, what we found is that 82% of campuses actually had student learning outcome statements. And we uh, show that as concrete, clear proficiencies that students are to achieve. Um, the vast majority of institutions have statements of learning for, for all their undergraduate students. And there are growing numbers that are actually aligning that throughout the institution. Um, I think that if we think of assessing for student success, you have to have uh, specific, clear, um, actionable, actionable, measurable student learning outcome statements for much of the work um, that you're doing, the, much of the work that you'll hear about in those emerging trends and next steps, this is the, the start uh, of all of that. And it, it's exciting work to see how many um, institutions are really engaging in this work. If you are looking for a resource, um, we actually have one by Clifford Edelman, who recently passed away this year, but definitely was a, a friend of NALOA and, and many other organizations. And in this work, he wrote um, a paper called To Imagine a Verb. And uh, he really took the language and syntax of learning outcome statements and didn't use the, the usual Bloom's taxonomy piece. He, um, not that he you know, disparaged Bloom's taxonomy, but thought of it a bit differently. Instead of using certain words, perhaps use different ones. Again, being a bit more specific, concrete with that. Um, for instance, right, instead of maybe saying students, are uh, the student develops an awareness of the importance of collaborative work, right? Perhaps you think of this. Student negotiates a strategy for group research or performance, documents the strategy so others may understand it, implements the strategy and communicates the results. Much clearer, much more specific, much more actionable, and again, measurable. So th that's just a common, we, we often see common student learning outcome statements. Um, that we know what they mean, well, potentially. We think we know what they mean, we assume we know what they mean, and then uh, we ask students and they are completely confused by it. I had a, um, someone at, at U of I and I think Health Sciences who came up with this really good swimming outcome statement. It was great, but I didn't understand it at all. And I mean, if you want to look for, for uh, complexity, she, she nailed that piece. But then I said, go take that to your students and see if they understand that or that they even did it. And I think that brings a different piece to it and really helps you understand how, how actionable and specific they are. Principle two, connecting learning goals and actual student assignments and work. I think that we're seeing much more of this, right? Um, a lot of the work that we're doing now is focused specifically around this. Um, as you see, you know, connecting it from the mission all the way down to the assignment level. There are some institutions that are, are definitely doing that and have been doing that for a while. Um, I, I think if you are able to do that, it shows that there's a lot of alignment with, throughout your institution, that you are coordinated and you all know where you're moving toward. Um, not to say that if that's not your institution, you aren't. Um, but I think that um, in some of these, some of the resources that we'll provide, and I think some of the, the things that we'll talk about uh, throughout the conference will help assist you to get to that point. Um, looking at some of the survey findings itself, um, we're definitely finding that they're increasingly aligned. I think if you see about 50% of campuses, all of them have actually, they have program learning outcomes and have actually aligned those with their institutional learning outcomes. I think the challenge that you often see is, is aligning the program learning outcomes with the course level outcomes. Um, so it's often hard to get to that assignment level, but definitely, um, definitely a possibility. We also um, have noticed, obviously, watermarks here, right? We look at a bunch of assessment management systems that are out there and, and technologies that are um, supposed to help. But in, in our survey results, we found that while those technologies hold promise um, in assisting with alignment and integration of learning across the institution, oftentimes meaningful imp implementation remains a bit elusive. We consistently seeing, you know, let's, let's get the technology and it'll happen, and that's not it. If you don't have those specific learning Actions, outcome statements and other pieces, 
technology just complicates it even more. So um, I, I think that we want to ensure that the technology is, is used is used properly um, and, and is necessary for certain pieces of it, but we have to understand what we're using it for. That said, we do have an occasional paper coming out soon um, around assessment management systems and helping you think through that, that, that process of what to use, um, how to use it, what's it for. Um, that should be out hopefully in the next month or so. Another theory finding that, that corresponds with uh, this particular uh, principle is around authentic measures of student learning. Um, what we are seeing is, is more of a shift to these classroom-based assessment uh, methods, whereas before um, national student surveys where we see them as, as third um, in that list, there's a, there's a longer list that I'll show you here in a second, but the national student surveys used to, to reign um, over that in that first survey that we took. So it's exciting and encouraging to see how classroom-based um, assessment approaches are, are really um, becoming more, more prominent. Um, institutions themselves are trending toward greater use of authentic measures of student learning, including rubrics, classroom-based assessments, and capstones, and that's consistent with what provosts had indicated are most valuable for improving student outcomes. When you look at um, one of the, some of the data points itself on, on our survey, uh, rubrics, classroom-based assessments, and portfolios have all jumped substantially in use since 2009. And again, provosts usually, um, they've indicated from the survey that these kinds of measures have the most institutional value. Uh, you'll see a, a slight dip with uh, portfolios from 2013 to 2017, but still much greater use in 2009. So I think uh, the next time we do this survey will be even more, um, hopefully, encouraged from the results um, and, and potentially see some of these others um, filter out a little bit more. One particular note, uh, the larger and the more selective the institution, the less likely they are to employ various assessment approaches or use actual results. Probably not a surprise, right? Not a surprise. Um, and, and that includes portfolios, rubrics, classroom-based performance assessments. So while not a big um, piece of our survey, that's something that we're definitely keeping track of and wanting to understand more around that. Uh, and, and it's, it's provided some, some interesting evidence uh, moving forward, especially around assessment. We did also find that institutions in the, I'm going to say WASC, now WASC, however you want to say it, region, um, were more likely than those in SACS, COC, to use portfolios um, at an institution level to assess student learning as well as capstone projects. So we did some, some a little bit of analysis around accreditation regions as well. So there's definitely some, some points here, um, definitely places where it's used more. Uh, understanding why would be I think, one of the next steps in, in how they're using it and if they're doing uh, an effective job in using those pieces, but I think that um, provides some evidence, uh, or especially around portfolios, portfolio use. As I think of, um, again, connecting assignments to the learning goals, um, we often in, at NALOA talk a little bit about just you know, conversations again that are happening out there. And one that we have um, really taken a hold of is around learning improvement. And um, if you think about how right now institutional program improvement is used, it's usually at the very beginning of a program, perhaps it's assessed or looked at, right? And then the whole thing goes by and at the end of the program, you then assess it again, right? And that's, that's the typical um, approach or, or practice. But if we start to really think about learning improvement, where we're looking a bit more intermittently at, at student learning, um, perhaps through assignments, we find out more and can, can adapt or change more, um, especially just in time. And then hopefully it's not the, the pre-post, right, at the, the very beginning and the end, then you wait for a while to then implement those improvements, but it can be a bit more spend, um, uh, useful in that time because you're doing it right away as opposed to that. So um, this this conversation I think has really prompted us to um, really use our assignment work um, in a different way. Um, since we've been we've been involved in a, a few initiatives, um, the multi-state collaborative was one of those where we worked with all of those regions to hold assignment design charrettes. So when you uh, uh, has anyone heard actually of the assignment charrettes themselves? There's a couple, yes, yes. 
Hopefully you've participated in one. If not, I I say absolutely go for it. I that's one of my favorite um, activities because you get um, really thoughtful people looking at assignments, and giving re really thoughtful feedback to that particular faculty member to take back and hopefully use to revise. So um, it, our response to some of this work has been to invite faculty um, to bring potentially a draft assignment, an assignment that they like, but it's not doing exactly what they need it to do, not one that they absolutely hate because that's just not going to work, but one that they, they like. Um, and then we brought them together for day-long meetings, and they worked in five to six person teams where they reviewed each other's assignments. Uh, they brought, most of them beforehand wrote up a reflective memo of the assignment to just kind of describe what that assignment was, what it could do, um, just some, some history around it. And then they get together, they ask questions about the assignment, and then the faculty member takes that feedback back, hopefully, and revises that assignment. And that wasn't a requirement that they revise the assignment there, but that it would hopefully prompt them to, uh, as they were on the plane, probably, to get back and, and go to their assignments. And it actually, I think it's pretty useful and definitely works in that way. Um, we took the term charrette from architecture education, which uh, meant a collaborative design process that's undertaken in a minimal amount of time. So we're hoping that in the short bit of time, they're encouraged to continue working um, outside of that charrette experience. From that, one of the uh, quotes that we got from a participant was that we have, we all have these things that we're subconsciously looking for when we grade assignments that we're regularly disappointed with. And then you get to poking around in your assignments and realize that nowhere in, the, in there did you re ever really ask them to demonstrate those things. The assignment design charrette is ex designed to do exactly that. We have those conversations consistently. I can remember one um, with an intro to forensic chemistry instructor who was giving a study guide out to her students. And one of the very first questions from the other participants were, who are your students? And she was like, oh, they're probably first, I think they're first generation college students. And then the next question was, well, do they even understand what a study guide is and what it's used for? And she was like, I don't even know. So that, even just that small two second conversation prompted her to rethink her process and explaining the assignment and the, the instructions of the study guide itself for them to understand what that meant. And hopefully, um, I would like to think, increase success in her class. Um, but we have, I need to follow up with her to see actually what happened. I think it'd be an interesting um, piece to that. And that's where some of our work has taken us now. We've conducted a lot of these charrettes. What's the impact and in, in the use of, of, of this work um, on campuses? So we're hoping that, that we're seeing um, some increased use there. A few of the lessons that we've learned um, from the charrettes and from just other campuses using this process, all of those, the materials, to, if you want to conduct your, the assignment design charrette on your own campus, are free. I should say all of the materials on our website are free um, and for you, so we are not member driven. So this process you can do on your own campus and really engages uh, faculty and we've had assessment people sit in and observe as well. You can really adapt this process uh, for your own uh, use. Well, from the lessons that we've learned, um, one is that assignments are intellectual work worth sharing. I think that's key. Oftentimes, assignments are very private, and so the process itself brings that out. Um, but if we can get faculty to share assignments, think about, again, how you could really work to connect to the learning goals of your institution. Um, number two, classroom work yields high quality actionable evidence, and that's what we want, right? That's exactly what we're hoping for. Um, and I think that uh, this work hopefully also yields those high quality assignments. Alignment is both a challenge and a payoff. A lot of this work, we were working with uh, institutions and, and faculty to align either to value rubrics or uh, to their own institutions student learning outcomes, whatever that is. That potentially, that work that's being done is very challenging. Lots of conversations that are happening, but I think pushes the institution forward. And then lastly, assignments promote equity goals for student success. Again, as that conversation I, I just mentioned about just thinking about who your students are in relation to those assignments, I think, um, again, benefits all students, uh, not just the few that are able to, to be successful without um, really delving a bit deeper into those assignments themselves. Moving to principle three, collaborating with relevant, relevant stakeholders, beginning with faculty. I think that's key, right? Faculty are key in this process. Assignment design work is key. 
you know, oftentimes uh, as an assessment person, it's, it's frustrating to um, get people to, to come into a conversation um, around whatever you're doing on your campus uh, with that. And I think that the assignment, assignment design piece gets exactly what faculty are doing, especially in teaching and learning. So the more you can find those places of connection, the, the easier it is um, to, to continue the process. Um, what we found in our survey was that institutional needs for advancing assessment work have shifted since 2009 from engaging more faculty in assessing student learning to actually supporting faculty use of assessment results and in increasing wider um, stakeholder engagement and involvement, which is extremely encouraging for us. Because we think of, um, we often hear the term buy-in and don't like it. So I'm not, if you say it, I'm not going to say, don't say that. It's bad words. But I think what we like to think of is that you're opening the door to a conversation. It's not that faculty need to be bought in to, to this work. They're engaged, they're invested in teaching and learning, right? How do we open that door to engage them um, in a different way? And I think that institutions themselves have been doing this, really been working at this since before 2009, but that's the first time that we documented that, but have really been trying to figure out how do we support um, their work and really thinking about professional development opportunities that engage them and allow them to do that work as opposed to just trying to initially engage them in the work. That said, you can see uh, another survey finding um, that institutional research offices and staff along with faculty-led assessment committees provide the needed support for institution-wide assessment activities. Oftentimes, um, just at the recent Association for Institutional Research Conference, they're like, I'm not being used. I have all this data, but no one wants it, or they don't want my analysis of it, and what am I here for? They are oftentimes some of the, the best people to collaborate with. They ask some really good questions, really um, engage about you know, who the students are and who are your students, and asking about um, how that connects to other parts of the institution. So considering them and using them as, as support um, are huge. You can see a, a few of the other um, assessment activities that are supported on the screen from our survey. But I think I'd like to think that Centers for Teaching and Learning also will be growing and increasing in these next few years. I've heard some really encouraging pieces of of how they're being engaged and used in college campuses, but um, it remains to be seen how how much of that actually happens. So definitely uh, something to watch. Looking at the next principle, designing a science assessment approaches that generate actionable evidence about student learning that key stakeholders can understand and use to improve student and institutional performance. There's a few resources I think that would be huge, helpful here as you're trying to, to think about what this principle means and what this could look like on your campus. Uh, this first paper is from is written by Natasha Jankowski, our director. She wrote it for the American Council on Education where she examined these five areas of intersection between instruction and student outcomes. And when we talk about student outcomes here, oftentimes it's persistence and graduation rates, right? There is a relationship. There are some key pieces that, that intersect between the two. And uh, by looking at that and, and I think, you know, by writing um, with that, we can hopefully further this conversation in this dialogue and really uh, get at the connection between the two. So those five areas were transparency, uh, pedagogical approaches, and I think here, um, is an important piece of where she really worked to emphasize those active applied and experiential learning processes. And then you have assessment, self-regulation, and alignment. So those five pieces are places um, that I think we could further unpack and it needs further unpacking as we think about uh, just student outcomes in general and how they relate to what we talk around, about around assessment and the importance of, of um, keeping those pieces together. One of the key takeaways, I think, from um, our survey itself is that institutions are using a variety of uh, data collection approaches, whether that's um, capstones, license exams, um, employer feedback, uh, surveys that are locally developed, whatever that is. Um, we're seeing that these approaches often yield really good, actionable information. Um, but I think that it reinforces the principle, again, that there's not one right way to assess student learning. There are many different ways. And, of course, portfolios, e-portfolios are one of them. Um, we recently had uh, an occasional paper written 
by George Koo, Laura Gambino, Mary Lee Bresciano Ludwig, and Ken O'Donnell on using e-portfolios to document and deepen the impact of HIPs on learning dispositions. And in this paper, they look at uh, the different facets of dispositional learning, such as fluid intelligence and interpersonal and inter intra interpersonal and intrapersonal competence, and explain why participating in well-designed high-impact practices, again, we've seen recent inside higher education important that literature, it's important, again, that they're well-designed HIPs, uh, like learning communities, service learning, undergraduate research, and community engagement, they can help students cultivate conscientiousness, uh, resilient self-regulation, reflection, and some of those other learning dispositions that uh, we'd like to see in our students. So I think that, that paper um, is just one resource um, that I think would, would be useful. There's another that's uh, the Catalyst in Action book. It's case studies of high impact e-portfolio practice that's due out in September of this year by Laura again, and, and Brett. You know, that really expound upon their first book of looking at uh, there they were trying to you know help solidify e portfolios as the 11th high impact practice but now they're looking at use cases and they have 20 case studies of various diverse institutions um, and how they're using e portfolios and I think this is a, it'll be a great resource once it's out. I think that the one of the main points around this is that portfolios and e-portfolios themselves, they're teaching and learning tools, right? They're not just technological ones. And if we consider that um, and, and think of that again as a pedagogical approach um, and, can, and hopefully get others to also um, think about it in that way, again, um, it really helps, uh, again, connect that relationship between instruction and student outcomes. Another survey finding um, underneath this particular principle is around changes in policies, programs, and practices that are informed by assessment results. Um, we saw that changes were most prominent at the program level. Uh, I think that you see changes in course, assessment, des assignment design, um, program curricular revisions, institutional policy, all of those pieces we're seeing changes in um, as a result of, of using assessment results that are gathered. Um, I think that George Koo, I think, yes, in a recent, uh, well, not, it wasn't recent actually, it was in 2007, in a Risky Business Change article, uh, talked a little bit about this itself. He said that many institutional leaders have little experience talking publicly about data that represents the core of their school's performance, about what actually happens to students in classrooms, laboratories, studios, practice fields, and beyond. But with practice and patience, we will all get better at deciding what to measure, how to measure it, and using what we learn to improve the quality of the undergraduate experience and other aspects of institutional performance. And I think that still brings true today. We're still trying to figure out how we put all those pieces together and really think about institutional performance and how we uh, use that to improve student learning. So I think we're, we're getting closer, and I'll show you some places of, of I think, where we're I think reaching um, some of those places and, and hopefully um, able to scale up some of those practices. The last principle, five, is focus on improvement and compliance will take care of itself. This is my favorite one, favorite one. I think that we often hear of that tension between compliance and improvement itself and that assessment continues to be driven by both, um, but we're seeing this continued emphasis on equity that we hadn't um, well, at least it might have been there uh, prior to this recent survey, but we just hadn't maybe asked the question um, in that way. And so it's encouraging to see that um, we have a couple of papers, um, the very first one, the very first occasional paper written by Peter Ewell on assessment, accountability, and improvement, revisiting the tension. I think is a seminal piece I think, in, in thinking about what this work uh, has looked like and where it's gone. And then Paul Gaston wrote a uh, piece on assessment and accreditation and imperiled symbiosis that I think also then looks at it now um, and moving forward that I think would, would also help um, as you're thinking about this conversation and, and the tension itself. And one of the, the, another finding from our survey was that institution level assessment results are regularly used for compliance and improvement purposes um, and addressing, and they usually address accreditation and external accountability demands along with internal improvement efforts. Um, I think that what we're seeing more of again with this around equity is this disag disaggregation of evidence of learning 
um, by various groupings of students. I've heard several initiatives by accreditors themselves um, how their institutions are disaggregating those results, um, not just the student outcomes data, but also by learning outcomes. So I'd like to think that in the next survey we'll be seeing more of that and have some more evidence on case studies around, around this work. Another finding kind of couched underneath this principle is that when we are assessing for student success, um, hopefully we're effectively communicating information about student learning. This is still, I think, a target of opportunity for this work. Um, and we're consistently trying to think of ways uh, of how to assist institutions in communicating this work. And you'll find that um, hopefully through our transparency framework, uh, we developed that about 2009, where we looked at, we web scanned over 3,000 institutions uh, to look at just what's on their pages, their web pages around assessment, and came up with this framework that has six, the six components that you see up there that help hopefully effectively communicate your story, at least through your website, but then also helps you organize the information in a way that makes sense. Um, and in that, we've uh, built upon that the excellence in assessment designation. Um, that uses the framework as key places of helping institutions kind of do a self-study of where they are around assessment institutionally and how they've integrated those approaches to really create this coherent narrative around student learning on their campus. We partnered with AACNU, Terry Rhodes, thank you very much for all your, your help there, and APLU, Association of Public Land Grant Universities, to do this work. Um, and continue to highlight those institutions that are, that are doing some really good assessment um, practices on their campus. So you'll see that uh, these were our 2017 designees. We have a total of 15 now. Um, we're nearing the 2018 process here shortly. Um, we'll see how many we have uh, for this year. And then 2016, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis was, was also one. Does anyone else see their institution up here? Okay, yours could be next. Yours could be next. So some promising developments that we've seen um, throughout, you know, as we've done the, sur the survey, as we've done the work around, you know, the occasional papers and the reports, all of these pieces, right, have led us to, uh, I think, um, come to some, some conclusions and hopefully some, some developments that you're seeing on your own campus. Um, where the shift towards more authentic measures of student learning, um, I think, is a positive one, and one that I think faculty and staff can grab a hold to and say, yes, we're doing this, and we've always known that it's been meaningful to our campus. We just, we're just waiting for you all to figure it out. Um, the, the, the kinds of things that are captured in student work from capstones, classroom assignments, those coupled with rubrics, uh, all those pieces are valuable sources of evidence for improvement. And I think, as, it, hopefully, as I've talked through some of this, you've been able to see how these, some of these trends align with the work that's happening on your campus. And if not, I think it's a place to start with your campus. How, how are we doing? What are we doing around these, these pieces, these particular pieces? Um, and, and here are some principles that hopefully will help guide our work. Some challenges that still exist, again, as I said, communicating effectively. Um, documenting, while we found that use of assessment results is increasing, that's continued to increase at least since 2009, um, documenting the work actually still falls short. Um, there's all, all kinds of opportunities that exist to allow for professional development activities if you really are figuring out what, what your faculty and staff need. Governing boards have a key role in this work. Uh, we've been trying to work with organizations like uh, the Association for Governing Boards to think, help them think through what governing boards need to know, what kinds of questions to ask. And then lastly, equity. It's, it's definitely undersized, underemphasized in data use, uh, but use of that data to help close those equity gaps, gaps is, is rare. And hopefully that will, again, we'll see some encouraging um, pieces in the years to come. Oh, sorry. I didn't to here. Should have told me. <laughs> so lastly, thinking of, again, the principles, the survey findings, all of that work, right, has led us to a point where we've been able to develop this framework to kind of help us think through um, all of these pieces. Uh, David Marshall, one of our senior scholars and Natasha Jenkins, our director, uh, wrote the book Degrees That Matter, Moving Higher Education to a Learning Systems Paradigm um, last year. 
that really helps us frame and rethink this work um, and helps us even build um, further. So thinking of this uh, shift in focus to teaching and learning from hopefully compliance, right? Uh, this new paradigm encourages faculty and staff to systematically seek out information on how well students are learning and how well various areas of the institution are supporting the student experience and to use that information to create a more coherent and explicit learning experience for students. Those four elements that you see up there are integral in, in any initiative, in any work, and you can't do it without all four. Not to say that one has to happen before the other, but all four are needed. So just to briefly go through some of these pieces, and you'll see on the left-hand side how the principles that I just discussed as well align with the framework quite well. Um, the first piece is consensus-based. Um, we have to have faculty-led conversations. And when we say faculty-led, that doesn't mean that they're faculty alone. We have to ensure that there are others that we're collaborating with. And in that conversation, hopefully a shared understanding and consensus is reached on the learning outcomes. Those are key. Again, we have to make sure that those specific actionable learning outcomes um, are, are consensus-based and uh, agreed upon throughout the institution. When we think of the next piece, aligned, that faculty and staff align educational experiences throughout the institution for intentional integration, coherence, and fostering of multiple pathways. This alignment could take the work of curriculum mapping, assignment design, co-curricular engagement, mapping of career pathways, whatever that is on your campus. But alignment um, is becoming increasingly important um, in, in the work. That said, there's all kinds of conversations that are happening. And this is one that I choose to um, really gravitate towards, right? We said read portfolios are the 11th high impact practice. There's conversations now are in a collegiate athletics, a high impact practice. And as a former athlete, that is me. I'm not gonna tell you the outcome of this race, but that is a picture of um, a long time ago when I, when I had a lot of fun. Um, but as I think back to, the, to what I did right, as an athlete, and I think back to um, the, the athletes that we have currently and all the work that they do and how little of it is counted, potentially it is. Uh, Kuhn O'Donnell had eight key elements that they helped to define a high impact practice and some, some researchers are looking at those high impact, the elements themselves to, to determine how could we make something like athletics and potentially other experiences that your students are having, high impact practices, uh, or they already are, we just need to document it in a way um, like you've done with ePortfolios. Third would be learner-centered. I think we've talked from very soon this meeting, it has to be learner-centered, right? But we reorganize educational experiences around all students. Otherwise, all this work is for nothing. We're just doing it again for ourselves. Um, if it's all about learning, so many op opportunities and possibilities open up. Uh, if we consider uh, issues of equity, learning focus transfer, prior learning assessment, stackable credentials, all of these pieces, are important to the student experience. Some of our current conversations are around equity and assessment. Um, both uh, one of our graduate research analysts, Eric Montenegro, and our director, Natasha Jankowski, wrote a paper um, early January of last year looking at uh, this, or trying to explore the relationship between um, equity and culturally responsive assessment. They put out some concepts and we are hoping that you all will help us continue the conversation. We've had several people read through this paper and offer some guest responses. So if you're so inclined, we would love to have a response from you thinking about this work further and what that means. So those concepts that it's mindful, that it's intentional, it uses appropriate language for all students. It develops um, and uses appropriate tools. It acknowledges student differences. Those concepts hopefully help inform what culturally responsive assessment practice looks like. Um, and I think the quote that's, that's listed helps, helps to kind of um, broaden this, what this means, um, not only for students, but for campuses as well. What is needed is not to help learners conform to the ways of higher education, thus reinforcing inequities and expectations based on ideologies students may ascribe to, but to empower students for success through intentional efforts to address inequality within our structures create clear, transparent pathways, and ensure that credits and credentials are awarded by demonstration of learning in whatever form that may take. That's, that's key um, in this work, and, and we're trying to hopefully uh, uh, 
um, understand it a bit more, better, explore it more, um, and really come up with some ideas. I think there's a, an institution right now that's trying to create a framework, but we're always willing to, to challenge those, those ideas. So if you have your own idea, please send it to us. We're, we're um, definitely trying to increase this conversation. Um, I think a, another piece around learner-centered, right, is asking students where they learn and why. Um, many institutions have been talking about these photo contests that they've been having on their own campus. If you look on the left, the University of Minnesota, Rochester, asked students when they were away at study abroad to take pictures of, again, where they were learning and what that looked like. If you look on the right-hand side, the University of Illinois, uh, they actually had one as well, um, where they had students upload an image of, of where learning took place for them and then write a brief narrative of uh, why that was considered learning to them. Um, one of the directors of the Center for Teaching and Learning there said, we have all kinds of pictures of teaching we have very few pictures of learning. And so she wanted to document it from a student's eyes as opposed to thinking that this is where learning happened. So we, again, by taking a, a learner-centered focus brings us to hopefully a different place um, and a different conversation and allows for, for different possibilities like things like this for, for it to happen. And then lastly, communicated. Um, really talks about, again, if we were moving away from compliance and towards improvement, we're, we're thinking about how we're communicating to, to our audiences um, this information. So communication and collaboration with students and other audiences through transparent discussions around the outcomes and educational system works to make the implicit explicit. Um, if students, faculty, if they don't know about the design, the, the intentional design, again, what's, what's the point? Um, I think that we have a lot of work to do. I think that with things like the excellence in assessment and other places, we're trying to help create this story um, and, and allow institutions to tell their story and specific to their context, we can do more. The portfolios are, are, are definitely a place that helps tell a story if we're doing it um, in intentional ways and, and could, could really help campuses understand what students are experiencing on their own campus and, and what they're learning. I think the initiatives like Comprehensive Learner Record, where uh, they're hoping to, to capture, document, communicate, and record the learning when and where it happens. It's a definitely an initiative that, that looks at that and helps help to communicate it in a visual way through the transcript or the record, whatever, whatever the campus usually calls it. But I encourage definitely by this work. Um, we found, though, through this work, again, if they don't have uh, actionable, specific learning outcome statements, this work doesn't happen. So again, principle one, extremely important here. And again, as, the, as I said, the excellence in assessment designation is, is something that's on that, that realm where we're also trying to help students tell their story, or help campuses tell their story. So with all of that, I'm just taking a moment to think about what does all of this mean for you and the work that's happening on your campus? And mainly, right, you can't do this work alone. As Susan mentioned, I was Director of Institutional Effectiveness and Planning, and there's no way I could have done any of this work by myself, whether it be strategic planning, whether it be accreditation, assessment. So who or with whom do you need to partner to do this work? To uh, I don't think any of the work that, that we do uh, can be just in a silo, otherwise it's not used, right? So how can you partner? What places make sense for you to partner? Um, I have conversations with um, places like athletic departments all the time, we had one that called and they were like, I just, I don't know, we want to have uh, some evidence around the student learning outcome, but our coaches don't grade papers. They don't, they don't know what they're looking for. And why wouldn't you collaborate with an English faculty member or if there's a particular piece that you're um, wanting the, the student athlete to um, expound upon, why wouldn't you figure out a way to connect with the other side, the active and fair side of the house? So there's definitely places that I think um, are natural collaborations, but oftentimes just need to be exposed or, or talked about a little bit more. But don't, definitely don't do it alone. So that said, I think we're transitioning, yes, to the next part of the discussion. And I'm interested, I mean, you, you've heard a lot. You need this. Thank you. I just wanted to say that um, we have time for, I think, one or two questions. Yeah. Um, I think 
think the next session is at 10.15, is that? Break it down. Oh, we're good till 10.15. Well, continue. <laughs> <laughs> what questions do you have? What, where do you, I guess, you know, how do you see yourselves at, at your own institution? Are you, could you be more involved and more engaged? What, what resources do you need to do your work that would be helpful or I could point you to? Thank you. Um, I guess I'm going through there. We were talking about the assessment of success uh, being based on cognitive failures. No, no, I'm here. And talking about how. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> we're, you were speaking about the assessment of success uh, being based on authentic values of student learning and specifically talking about um, class assessment rubrics and portfolios being on the rise. I was curious um, when you were talking about if there's forms of assessment that are. Fine. Sure, oh, will you go back to slide? The one with the graphs, which is slide 13. Oh, I can go back. I want to. I will close your eyes, everyone. <laughs> So yes, and I'll send this um, slides to Tracy, and you can also send those out so you can see them more. Um, yes, there have been. Um, we talked about the, all, I, I will say, I'll couch it with, in 2009 was the first time we have taken the survey, so all of them were probably relatively low. So it's, we use that data as, it's here, but not really here, because it, it was a bit different. And, and actually, some of our definitions change of what that looked like. So we might have um, pulled out a few pieces. Um, so they're not as broad in the, the reiterations of the survey. So we tried to be as longitudinal as we could with most of it. But some of it, we just couldn't anymore because names had changed or, or things like that. So you'll see here that, again, if you look at 2009 data, all of them are lower than, than the other ones. But if you look between 2013 and 2017, there were some that decreased, but not, I don't think, uh, there weren't any that were significant enough um, that we were, um, I guess, interested in. We saw that, that there were less around general uh, knowledge um, and skills measures. That was one, but still not enough, um, I guess, not cause for concern, but that warranted more there. I think um, with this next iteration of the survey, if we do see some more trends where these, uh, some of them are a bit more significant than they were, we would investigate a little bit more, but not, not enough. I think that we were um, most, not necessarily surprised, but encouraged by that rubrics and classroom-based assessments became, you know, kind of overtook uh, national student surveys because that had been the main source for many institutions around assessment. Um, activities and, and practices and the fact that those are still there and there's still really good tools and measures that to be used but that they weren't relying on those and that they didn't consider those the most valuable uh, any, anymore. I think that was more of a, um, a, a piece that we were most interested in. Thank you so much for your talk. You're definitely speaking my language. Um, so one of the hats that I wear as a curriculum designer, and I often run into faculty who um, are resistant to learning outcomes because they feel like it's reducing students to a series of metrics, like they're taking the magic out of learning. Um, the the that sparkle that. in their eye, they can't <laughs> measure that. Uh, and I, I was even recently at a conference where the keynote speaker said, um, measurable learning outcomes are overemphasized. I think the best learning outcome I can have for my students is that they have an epiphany. And you know, yeah, so, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm looking for a response to that because I often don't have the language to convince people. So, what do you think when you run into that kind of critique? Were you with a group of faculty members or was it just one? Oh, I, I this is just sort of like just abroad. Yeah, I, I encounter it kind of regularly. So, oh, I, conversation, continued conversation. I, the most resistant often, if, if I was going to say if it was in an audience, it's, um, it's the easiest 
ways. It, oftentimes that's a, a common thing. You can't measure it. And then other faculty are like, yeah, you can't measure it. And then that pushes you off to another uh, conversation. But I think um, when we ask them, when we, at U of I, for instance, um, we've never had student learning outcomes institutionally. And this past year, two years ago, um, they were developed one by our former project manager, Stacey Provisis, um, at Naloa, went to the provost office and took this job on. I don't know why, but she did, because U of I is huge um, in terms of undergraduate and graduate degree programs. Obviously, we did that because we're going to be accredited here in 2020, so unfortunately, it was compliance-based and not, not improvement, but Stacy knows all about it. She's ready for it. And in that conversation, lots of faculty members were like, why? Why are we doing this? We don't need to do it. We haven't been doing it, but you have. You have been improving. You have been uh, adapting your assignments to assist students. We just haven't documented it in that particular way. And I think that what, as we get more into the conversations of, of why we're doing it and, and having those, it can't just be a general conversation. It has to be, I guess, a, a bit more in depth then you're going to have some that just still aren't, but you'll have many that will. And I think that um, what, we're, what I'm seeing and I'm encouraged by on, on our campus, the, a large campus, is how many faculty are engaged in the conversation and having the conversation with each other, not just you telling them, you know, you need to do it for this reason, but ha having them just bounce ideas off of each other about, oh, we're thinking about this, and then they're oftentimes they love to peer review, right? So giving them a chance to, to give some feedback to each other, that's been extremely important. So again, don't do this alone. <laughs> You'll be in your office crying, don't make you cry. But um, really having some, some good conversations, again, about why they do it, what, what they've been doing, um, often leads you into a conversation and maybe you have to write it down as they're talking, but it still gets you there. Terry, did you have something to say? You sure? He's gonna wait till tomorrow. I felt like he did. Go ahead. Uh, I, thanks for the talk. Um, you just prompted us to think about what we should do with one of our campuses. It's a good work with the political scientist, uh, Barry Rose, who is a new here. And it seems to me, I wanted to hear your thoughts about how you work with um, the disciplinary associations in their kind of teaching and learning people. Um, because it seems to me that action on these fronts seems very challenging at the large university. Oh, for sure. Um, but chemists listen to their association and psychologists listen to their association. So, what's the role there? How do you work with those uh, disciplinary associations? Absolutely. Those are key in getting much of this work done. Um, through the degree qualifications profile and tuning work, and we have that. If you look on our site, on, that, on our website at the top, it says degree qualifications profile, but there's still tuning um, information on that site. That's been the, how we've gotten through um, and in to some of those disciplinary associations, uh, specifically the tuning piece. Um, we've worked with the American Historical Association and National Communications Association to do uh, actual tuning processes. And through that, they were able to establish learning outcomes for their entire discipline. And so we're hoping that others uh, take hold of that because, again, disciplines listen to, oftentimes it's not the institution itself that, um, I guess, the, the, uh, that faculty often um, grab those learning outcomes from, but it's the discipline maybe that they could take and maybe adapt at their institution that's been um, more useful. But we're definitely seeing a few disciplinary associations, associations do that. I think perhaps uh, American Sociological Association is next. Um, so as, the more that we can work with them, I think that process makes complete sense. And even in Cliff's, uh, Cliff Edelman's paper, right, he talks about the, how you write your learning outcome statement is also discipline um, focus. So it's, you have to consider all those other pieces of context. And I think that's important as, you, as you're doing the work. So perhaps political science could get on board. That would be awesome. You could start it. We have lots of materials from other associations if you're interested. 
seeing, right? I think that's the challenge is aligning all of the work uh, to the classroom level, but it has to be. Um, I th we, I'd say in, in a lot of the work that we do, it's more institutional. Um, that doesn't necessarily go down to the, co the course level, but I, I'd like to think that that's where we go next. Um, we have a bunch of assessment and practices uh, from that have kind of developed from case studies where we, we see how um, faculty members, staff members are thinking about assessment themselves. So we have a, a few of those examples. We haven't really compiled them in a, I guess, a, a way to, to use them effectively. You have me thinking, always, always feedback, we love feedback. Um, I think that that's an important piece um, moving forward. There's a lot of good work happening. We just haven't documented it in, in a way that um, I think makes sense or that others can see what's been happening to to show that but that's exactly what's what's needed next so if you have something we would love for you to write something <laughs> for us i think that's important when i go to conferences like this uh, when all of us go to conferences i'm with the lowest staff that's where we find those on the ground practice pieces uh, when i went to there was riverside college in california um, they were doing some interesting work. I like escape rooms. They sound fun, right? They're doing some th this work around their, how they're having their faculty and staff do an escape room centered around assessment. I mean, I had I not attended the conference, would have never even known about the idea, but I think that's an, a great way. Not everybody likes escape rooms. Don't know what those are. But thinking about how to just engage people in the conversation, that was just one idea about that. And what are those other ideas um, that really get at um, good assessment practice, I think we're always interested in. So again, if any of you do have some some great ones, we'd be very happy to, to try to highlight some of those. So let me know. I think, uh, just bridging here. Yeah. Just bridging uh, between the stakeholder groups, right? Because as faculty members, we're often doing this work and faced with the work in our classrooms, and we are for sure talking about assessment, but that, that word, Often There's. something quite different in a classroom context yes. than it means for the assessment office. And I think even just bridging and reaching out to the assessment folks, which um, have a lot of expertise, and I know that's something that I often forget to do is, you know, what are they doing that might help me and vice versa? And I think, you know, just even if we take that away and think about how we might start to build those bridges, that could be a really positive first step that would generate some of that information that you are dying about, right? Oh my gosh, please. And then I think the examples that we do have institutionally are where institutions, the different stakeholder groups, are working together in that way to integrate results and uh, thinking about how they move forward. And to to your point, sometimes it's not called assessment on on a campus. Maybe it's research. Maybe it is something else that speaks to the context that you're in. So words matter all the time. Go ahead. I think this has been fairly informative. Good. Um, 
I've been thinking a lot about how we, at our university, we're trying to get some of this started in the classroom. And I'm wondering if it would be valuable to try to shift the focus in the tenure promotion process away from student surveys to outcome and assessment and how we might start doing that. Be very careful. <laughs> Be very, very careful, but I love it. Um, one thing that we're seeing with our excellence in assessment designees, uh, many of those actually have done some serious work around tenure and promotion um, with their faculty and recognizing assessment as um, not just an, and necessarily in the service or the research piece, but as a part of teaching and learning. And I think that, that if you put it in some of those places, I, absolutely, um, but just be very careful that it's not. Or, uh, evaluated in that that way because I think that's where you'll you'll find some resistance. Um, but it, but potentially, right? If you it's consensus based, right? If you encourage faculty uh, to participate or even lead that conversation, perhaps there's some places of agreement um, that that makes sense. Well, yeah. I think our main uh, issue we run into is that they don't want to include outcomes assessment in what they're doing because. It takes time away from things they need to do. Is a, and so if it's acknowledged as a part of the tenure promotion process, then that definitely helps. But we often hear that all the time. You're asking me to do these things, which are completely, it, but it's not divorced from teaching. It, it's what you're supposed to be doing. So it, you have to have that conversation consistently. And there's some that absolutely um, jump right on it. But again, it has to be recognized. Uh, otherwise, again, what's the point there? Thank you all so much. I hope that it did was helpful. I hope that you know as you work on your own institutions to maybe scale up practice or start um, in, or sustain the, the current practices that you have that this helps. Um, again, please consider us a resource and consider us a place uh, to bounce ideas off of. We're always looking for um, the next conversation in assessment. We're trying to to hopefully provoke some of those those thoughts and, and highlight some really good assessment practice, but we're, we're definitely um, here and available. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Janina. That was uh, certainly a jam-packed talk. Don't go away. Oh. <laughs> stay right I here. Leave. Don't just stay right here. Um, I, just one short thing I wanted to say in response to that question about measuring epiphanies, because I get asked that all the time, and I have been serving. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. I'll try that one. So try that one. And now? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I. Thank Janina for that very, very uh, helpful and um, comprehensive talk. I, I think it'll take us all a while to unpack all of that. Um, I wanted to say something about measuring epiphanies. Um, I could say a lot about that, actually. I, I get asked that a lot as well. Um, I, I do think that the more that we use the kinds of authentic performances and measures that Janina was talking about, the more likely it is that assessment will capture epiphanies. And I would also say that e-portfolios are an especially effective way for creating the conditions that lead to epiphanies and capturing and enabling us to see those epiphanies in action. Um, and I hope we'll get to talk about that some more at the conference over the course of the next few days. Yeah, and just on behalf of all of us, um, please join me in thanking one more time Janina Baker for this fantastic talk. <laughs>